I'm Roger Stone, and you're on The War Room with my colleague Owen Scheuer. The John F. Kennedy uh, document dump that was authorized by President Donald Trump has dominated the media this week. The president, uh, in accordance with the 1992 JFK Records Act, uh, has uh, not exercised his authority to delay the release of the last 3,100 files held by the federal government and pertaining to the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Uh, the great concern now by researchers and those interested in the historical record as well as the truth is that the Central Intelligence Agency and the other government agencies who internally oppose the release of these records will now see to it that they are so redacted, so censored, and so much material is held back on the basis of national security that the data release becomes meaningless. We will be monitoring the first release by the National Archives and bringing you a report on that as soon as it happens. One of the aspects of the John F. Kennedy case did bubble up during the 2016 presidential election when the National Enquirer published a photo from the Warren Commission report of a man with Lee Harvey Oswald in New Orleans who they alleged was Rafael Cruz, the father of U.S. Senator Ted Cruz. I believe the National Enquirer is correct. Uh, Donald Trump, then a candidate for president, used the National Enquirer story to needle his opponent, and indeed, Ted Cruz took the bait. Today, joining me is an extraordinary guest that I'm excited to have here at the War Room, Judith Very Baker. Judith Baker, without any question, uh, had an intimate personal relationship with Lee Harvey Oswald. Her book, Lee and Me, is a must read for anyone who wants to understand this period of American history and what really happened in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. Judith Very Baker joins us now. Welcome to the War Room. Hello. Hello. That's the book. Thank That's you very book. much, Roger. Uh, I am so happy to have you here because you, Judith, are an eyewitness to history. I am merely a researcher. Jim Mars, a great researcher. St. John Hunt, a great researcher. Jim Fetzer, a great researcher. Gerald Posner, a not so great researcher. <laughs> But you have a, an actual eye into history because you were there. You knew Lee Harvey Oswald. You were in New Orleans. You were in Dallas. And therefore, I'm interested in your expert opinion on whether the photograph that we're showing is indeed Rafael Cruz, the father of Senator Ted Cruz. Well, I say this Judith? with care. I say this with care and with deliberation. I was present when um, Lee asked me to uh, come forward and to take a look, just a quick look at Mr. Cruz. Now, I didn't know his last name. Lee said this was his guardian angel, Raphael the Archangel. And I was interested in his face because I, I don't remember faces that well. So I was really concerned because when Lee was on Canal Street just a week earlier, he had been accosted by uh, three people and that was, that was just a stunt. But the fact of the matter is a, a crowd gathered and he was in danger. I, I, I ran to a policeman right away and, and asked him to intervene. I was afraid he'd get beaten up. So they moved this. Now, they, this is the FPCC, the Fair Play for Cuba Committee that uh, Lee was passing out flyers for is very unusual in that it had no meetings, no members, and no one but Lee in it. It was a sting operation that was being run by the FBI. And 
So when we say that Lee Oswald was involved in this and that this gentleman with who was helping him, assisting him, was helping, we're talking about something that was good. They try to make something evil out of it because they don't want anyone to know that Lee Oswald was working for the FBI and he was also, you know, an asset with the CIA, he had been borrowed from the Office of Naval Intelligence. I knew him very well. I knew his heart. So now he's telling me, uh, just take a look, just a quick look. Don't talk to him because um, we're not supposed to really know each other, you know, out on the street like that. It wouldn't be safe for me. And Lee knew that. He is, what he's doing is he's getting people to take these flyers. And some of the people taking the flyers were being followed by the FBI because if they were Latino and they responded to the flyers and went uh, and uh, like wrote to the post office box or tried to go to a meeting that didn't exist, they were considered suspicious and probably Castro spies. Lee was there to mop them up. And we have Rafael Cruz, I didn't know his last name. But Raffaello, as Lee affectionately called him, was watching his back. He did not even hand out any of these flyers. He was standing there. So I took a good look at him. I didn't know his last name. It was years before I realized when I saw other photos, same ears, same. Uh, you have a lot of distinctive features that even in the old man show up. I was astonished when I saw that this was Rafael Cruz. Now I saw him twice. I got close enough to see him. Uh, you know, he's wearing a white shirt and tie, just like Lee. This was, a, as I say, set up operation going on. And uh, they actually did catch some spies. It was the third, there was one out at the Dumaine Wharf. To make a long story short, I was present. I saw him twice. And Lee showed me um, as he was going across Lafayette Park. We were there at Lafayette Square. And he was going toward Guy Bannister's office. Bannister was involved in this operation, former head of the FBI in Chicago. I'm a living witness and I verify for you. Also, I'm trained in forensic anthropology. And uh, as an artist and so on, you know, the characteristics, I've put them on uh, Facebook and other places. This was Rafael Cruz. Judith, you have pointed out that Rafael Cruz had failed to file for the Selective Service, the draft, which in 1963 was a felony. And we know that he would subsequently flee to Canada to avoid prosecution, where Ted Cruz was, of course, famously born, making him, in my opinion, constitutionally ineligible to be president. But putting that question aside, uh, I have read your extensive posts on Facebook. You are a living witness to history. And today, I want to thank you for coming here and clearing up this question. Let's be precise. The National Enquirer is correct. Donald Trump yes. is correct. The man on the ground in New Orleans is Rafael Cruz, the father of Ted Cruz. And he's a uh, good man, to, and one so more time, Lee Oswald. Uh, and I want They're to commend, for anyone who wants to know more about this, uh, Judith's terrific book, Lee and Me, is an absolute necessity for anyone who wants to understand how the U.S. government took a patriotic American who was serving his country, Lee Harvey Oswald, who had been an informant for the FBI, had been detailed to the CIA and was set up as a patsy. As he said that day, I didn't shoot anyone. Thank you, Judith Baker, so much for joining us here at The War Room. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thanks. Uh, folks, you cannot get this kind of reporting any place else. So now would be a terrific time for you to head to the Infowars.com store and help us get the lifeblood to continue these fabulous broadcasts. Welcome back to the War Room. I'm Roger Stone with my colleague Owen Scheuer, the fearless. One of the most interesting stories involved in the assassination of President John F. Kennedy is the story of Dorothy Kilgallen, 
Dorothy Kilgallen was one of the most influential journalists uh, in 1960s America, a columnist for the New York Journal American with a popular morning radio show who became a national figure uh, because of her participation in a popular television game show, What's My Line? Dorothy Kilgallen would uh, obtain uh, the only known private interview with Jack Ruby, the man accused of killing Lee Harvey Oswald, the alleged assassin of President John F. Kennedy. Uh, at the time of her death, Dorothy Kilgallen was working on a book which she promised would blow the lid off the John F. Kennedy murder cover-up. She also intimated that Lee Harvey Oswald was working for the government. Joining me now is Mark Shaw, the author of a book called The Reporter Who Knew Too Much. Mr. Shaw is a former criminal defense attorney, legal analyst for CNN, ESPN, and USA Today. He's an investigative reporter and author of over 25 books. And in this case, he has written an extraordinarily interesting book about the mysterious death of Dorothy Kilgallen. Miss Kilgallen uh, was found dead uh, before her book came to publication. Before uh, the time of her murder, she gave a copy of the manuscript uh, for her book to Mrs. Earl E.T. Smith, Florence Smith, one of her best friends. Florence Smith would be found dead two days later, and the manuscript was never found. Mark Shaw, welcome to the War Room. Well, thank you, Roger. I'm looking at your website, and uh, you look good in sunglasses on there. You look good. You look uh, like you're uh, right on top of things here. Well, it's the Sam G. and Kana look, as I like to say. <laughs> Why don't you uh, tell uh, the folks uh, uh, really who Dorothy Kilgallen was and why she seemed to be so obsessed yeah. about learning the truth about the Kennedy assassination? Well, uh, it's amazing, uh, Roger. I really never intended to write this book, but when I started finding out about, uh, about um, Dorothy, I decided to because I didn't even know she was involved in the JFK assassination. A lot of people don't. You know, they remember from what's my line, and they don't know about this. And it, it's interesting because uh, that's a good question. There's a couple of things I want to um, talk to you about uh, that you've mentioned. But uh, this was a personal thing for Dorothy. Now, I have to remember the New York Post called her the most powerful female voice in America. She was on top of the world. Uh, no media uh, icon in history, I don't think, can, can uh, match up with Dorothy. Um, but um, it was personal because JFK was actually a friend of hers. They had met socially. Uh, she knew him real well. He'd been to her home, all of that. And uh, an event happened that changed everything for her. She took her little son, Carrie, to the White House. You've been there, of course. And um, JFK made a real fuss over little Carrie. He talked, about, talked to him about the letters he'd brought from his third grade class. And gave him a, a you know a um, a, a pin uh, a PT109 pin for his lapel. Made a real fuss over him, and that just you know bowled over Dorothy uh, that that he would do that. So when JFK died, uh, Dorothy, who was always a very suspicious person uh, based on her columns and her uh, investigative reporting of many of the major trials of the 20th century, Dr. Sam Shepard and all of that. She decided that she wanted to look into this. A lot of things didn't make sense to her, as you've written about in your books. And so she launched this 18-month investigation uh, into the JFK assassination. And I think, uh, arguably, it's the most compelling one in history uh, for, for the main reason that what? Dorothy Kilgallen was there. A lot of the authors, me, you, everybody else who writes about this, we weren't there. But Dorothy was there. Uh, we have the proof through videotaped uh, um uh, videotapes of her being in a press conference with Melvin Belli and Joe Tonahill, the uh, lawyers for Belli. Uh, she she interviewed Jack Ruby, as you said. So Dorothy Kilgallen is right there, and that's why I think uh, people should really pay attention to what Dorothy found out. Now, do you believe that her death was suspicious, and is there new evidence uh, that proves that she was murdered? Well, you know, uh, it's, it can't be a coincidence that right before she was about to write this, you know, finish this book, uh, naming names and, and going for it, you have to kind of go back just a little bit, Roger, to understand what uh, was happening here. Uh, she ended up at the Jack Ruby trial, and uh, 
I'm going to play a little bit uh, devil's advocate with you about the whole thing with Oswald. I think Dorothy, based on what I have in the book and the paperback condition, and in fact just came out this week with some new evidence in it, uh, she focused on Jack Ruby. I think she felt like Oswald was kind of a dead end. Uh, there was just so many unanswered questions about him, and maybe these new JFK files will provide more information. But she focused on Ruby, and she ingratiated herself with uh, Belli and Tonahill. You can see Tonahill's interview on the uh, Dorothy Kilgallen story dot org, where he talks about how the interview with Ruby took place. And so I think she thought uh, that he was the key, and whatever Ruby told her centered in New Orleans. And we remember that, uh, you know, there was that whole 1960 election deal that you're very familiar with where, you know, the Kennedys basically bought the election through the mafia, Sam Giancana and the others, to help them win Illinois and West Virginia. And with the deal being that if they helped, the new administration would leave them alone. Well, they uh, put Bobby Kennedy in the attorney general's uh, chair, and Bobby went after those guys, especially Carlos Marcello. Uh, the New Orleans kingpin. So that's where Dorothy went after the Ruby trial. She went there once. She was about to go again. And then all at once, uh, on November 8, 1965, she was found dead uh, in her townhouse. And I think you know where that is on East 68th Street. Um, in a bedroom she never slept in, in wearing clothes she never wore to bed. Uh, she had on her makeup, her eyelashes, and a hairpiece she never wore to bed. Uh, and there were all kinds of questions about uh, there being a staged death scene. But as happened many, happens many times, uh, when uh, somebody knows too much, and in this case she was a reporter who knew too much, uh, they decided she had died of an accidental overdose of barbiturates and alcohol, no investigation at all at the time. So Dorothy Kilgallen was basically uh, buried for 50 years until I was able to uncover new information about her, and she's now become part of the equation in assessing what really happened uh, with JFK's assassination 50-plus years ago. Uh, there was an intercession of her career with Marilyn Monroe, who, of course, is famously tied uh, to the Kennedys. Uh, as I recall it, um, she was one of the first and only reporters to break uh, intimations of a relationship between Monroe and the Kennedys. And then, of course, Monroe was very shortly thereafter found dead uh, uh, in uh, California. Uh, I have uh, always been fascinated um, by this story. I also remember reading that Kilgallen was found holding a book, which she had told friends she finished three weeks previous. So uh, okay, it, it I'm, certainly I'm, I'm, yeah. seems suspicious. Yeah. Well, I tell you, I'm amazed at your uh, your memory there of two things that a lot of people, you know, forget. Uh, let's let's go with them. Uh, first, with Marilyn. Um, if you go to the uh, Dorothy you know, Kilgallen, uh, if you hold on one second here, Mark, Mark, if you hold on one second, we're going to go to the break, and we'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm Roger Stone, and you're on the War Room. We are still joined by Mark Shaw, who's written a terrific book, The Reporter Who Knew Too Much, the story of legendary newspaper reporter and television personality Dorothy Kilgallen. Mark, a, a final thought on uh, your terrific book and the significance of Dorothy Kilgallen in our history. Well, first, I want to, to take a little issue with your saying that she gave the manuscript to Florence Smith. I'd really be interested to see what research you've done to find that out, because we, we haven't been able to. So I'd like to know about that uh, sometime, Roger. Uh, with Marilyn Monroe, she was one of the first ones to, uh, yes, report that JFK and uh, Marilyn had had some uh, fun together. And so that certainly happened. And you mentioned the book on her lap that she'd uh, read. Uh, I mean, it doesn't take a, a brain surgeon to realize, with all the things I told you about, uh, that there was a staged death scene there, and yet there was no uh, investigation. As far as Dorothy's place in history, uh, you know, you're a man of the truth, and, and you don't want to have distortions of history. And that's why I think it's so important for anyone who's talking about the assassinations, the JFK files coming out tomorrow, whatever it would be, uh, to, 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 to look at Dorothy Kilgallen's research, make up their own mind about what she, uh, she found out again, her columns, uh, interviews about all of it are at the Dorothy Kilgallen story dot org. And I think people then can see that, again, she's, the mo I believe, the most credible uh, person to ever cover the assassinations because she was there. She was at the Ruby trial. You have to remember also, Roger, uh, and I'm sure you do, uh, Dorothy had an incredible exclusive because she 
uh, a very courageous woman, she was able to release, expose the Jack Ruby testimony before the Warren Commission uh, before it was to be released. And uh, you can imagine how big of a deal that was at that particular time. And that's when uh, her closest friend said that, uh, you know, she knew she was in danger. She bought a gun. She told one of her hairdressers, if the wrong people knew what I know about the JFK assassination, it would cost me my life. I'm afraid for my life and family. And she was dead shortly thereafter. All right. Thank you very much, Mark Shaw. This is a terrific book, and we commend it to you. Thank you so much for joining us today on The War Room. It's been a real, a uh, real now pleasure. I am thank, joined, you, thank you, Mark. Uh, now I am joined by Sam Nunberg. Sam Nunberg is not known to the American people widely, but for about two years, he was uh, the Donald Trump campaign, working as an issues coordinator, writer, researcher, scheduler, advisor, and traveling companion for Donald J. Trump. He joins me today. Sam, thank you. Roger. Uh, tell us um, off the top, how do you think President Trump is doing? On foreign policy, I give the president an A. On executive authority, executive orders, I give him an A. And on Congress, you know, unfortunately, while the majority of the responsibility goes to the dysfunctional uh, Senate leadership, I'd say, you know, you have to give him a B minus. You know, at the end of the day, the president is supposed to get legislation passed and his staff that he brought in from the transition had a bad plan, whether, you know, the Ryan's previous Paul Ryan go with Obamacare first instead of a tax cut. And um, we'll see. I think that at the end of the by the end of this year, we're going to know if he's able to pass a tax cut. If the Senate, if McConnell can actually get a tax cut passed, then he'll probably have a B plus. I think it's vitally important uh, that there be a business tax cut. You know, the liberals always call it a corporate tax cut, mm -hmm. but it's a tax cut for all businesses, big and small that is at a rate lower than Mexico, lower than Canada, lower than China, lower than Japan. To me, this is the key to Donald Trump's success. A, a robust, vibrant economy bringing jobs back to America will give you the revenues to fix a dozen other problems, uh, and a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, I, I don't trust McConnell. Neither I don't I. trust the Senate Republicans. Mm -hmm. uh, they like the status quo. Um, I am hopeful, though, the president will stick to his guns and get it done. And going to that point, if you think about it, all we've gotten from a domestic standpoint financially on the economics, uh, just because President Trump happens to be president and he it represents a, vi you know, a vibrant economy, but all we've gotten are continuing resolutions from Barack Obama's budget and basically clean debt ceiling raises. He hasn't been able to get his economic plan through. Now, it's probably also, Roger, partly his fault, too, for bringing people in, people in like Gary Cohn, not bringing in a Larry Kudlow. I don't know how Jared convinced him to do that. That, you know, was one of the major failings. And today is actually a good day. Ding dong, Gary, the globalist, as uh, the Fed chair, is officially dead. But um, that, you know, that goes back to that. If he had put Larry in, Larry Kudlow, Stephen Moore things would have been a lot different. Yeah, no, I think that uh, Kudlow and Moore produced, uh, working with the president, one of the most dynamic pro-growth economic programs, proposals I've ever seen a candidate put forward. Now mm -hmm. it's crucial that the president stick to his guns. Don't right. be talked out of it. Don't be talked into watering it down. Well, that also goes to what we were talking before during the break. An interesting poll came out today where overall 70% of Americans want the Iranian nuclear deal that Obama and Hillary Clinton negotiated, uh, renegotiated, redone. Something like 85% 85, 85 of Republicans, 71% of independents, and a majority, 55% of Democrats. Well, that goes back to Donald Trump doing what Donald Trump wanted to do. He wanted to get out of the deal during the first 90 days of his administration, then during the next 180, and he finally got out of it. Why, did, why, was, why was there a delay? Because of McMaster, because of Kelly, because of Mattis. The Pentagon, these generals, convincing him to stay in this deal. It was asinine to me. I know Infowars has criticized that deal. It was going to lead to the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard having nuclear arms. They don't have them yet. And he had to fight his own staff on that. I mean, what, you know, this president, you know, when Cor Corker says it's a daycare center, this, he's not joking because that's what his staff says behind his back. You know, interestingly enough, I understand that General H.R. McMaster actually gave the president an option memo and urged him to sign it that would have authorized the sending of 50,000 troops to Afghanistan. Right. And that the president looked at it and said, what is this? 
Right. Could, could we talk about this, please? Right. Uh, and ultimately, he would not sign. This tells me that in his heart, Donald Trump is a non-interventionist. He knows the American people are tired of endless wars mm -hmm. where our national interests are just not and that, and that goes to another problem, too. You had Jared and Reince Priebus pushing for McMaster instead of uh, Bolton being national security advisor, who did not want to put in a lot. He, he's ready to leave Afghanistan. I've spoken to him personally about it. And one of the other problems was, was when they got Kelly to replace Reince Priebus, as you've previously reported, they will not let Safra Katz, who sat at a dinner with McMaster, where McMaster got drunk and belligerent and criticized the president, they will not let her meet and talk to the president about this. And that was one of the main issues why Kelly also moved to get Steve Bannon out of the White House very quickly. And th that's part of a problem, too. Look, Kelly, if he wants to be the chief of staff, he calls himself, I control the information flow. That's what he said in that press conference a week ago. Well, then how about you get those Gold Star families' numbers to the president? Because you and I know Donald Trump. Donald Trump, that would be his first and top priority had they been to his desk? I, I, I know for a fact that the president called everybody for whom he was given a phone number. Correct. This is poor staff work that is not the blame of our president. He holds our military in the highest possible mm -hmm. regard. Uh, I, I do think that he is being uh, poorly served by his staff. Right. Uh, and, and I really do blame Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law, for the large number of globalists and neocons that infect this administration. Uh, it was Senator Robert Corker who convinced the president to endorse Luther Strange in Alabama. A well, disaster and Jared, disaster, too. And Jared Kushner, with the support of um, uh, Dina Habib Powell, <laughs> who is a great pal and running buddy of Senator Corker. Just a disclaimer, Corker left the U.S. Senate under FBI and SEC Correct. investigation into the tens of millions of dollars that he has made while sitting in the U.S. Senate. Uh, Sam, what do you think? Uh, well, we're, we're going to we're just about out of time here. Let me thank my guest, Sam Nunberg. Let me ask you one more time to give us the support we need by going to the Infowars.com store where we have extraordinary uh, savings and discounts to fund the resistance. Welcome back. I'm Roger Stone, and you're on The War Room here at Infowars. I'm joined uh, by my former colleague from the Trump campaign, Sam Nunberg. Sam is not only uh, an issues writer, a researcher, a speech writer, an idea man, but he's also an attorney at law, uh, which is why I want to ask him about Robert Mueller's mm -hmm. current activities uh, and where he sees the special counsel's investigation going. Well, it's an interesting and complicated question, Roger. First of all, I don't know why Robert Mueller was ever, one, appointed to this position. Rosenstein, you know, could have picked 320 million people in this country. He had to pick Robert Mueller. Uh, number two, how Robert Mueller is not conflicted out just by the very relationship he has with Comey, where Comey has called him his mentor. And number three, for the fact that Donald Trump met with him a couple days before that, I believe, or maybe a week earlier, where Mueller wanted to try to become the head of the FBI to replace, you know, get his old job back. Um, I think this is I think this investigation, besides the fact it's overly broad and, and let's blame uh, Jeff Sessions for this. He should never have recused himself entirely or, uh, you know, he could have issued a recusal maybe relating to the campaign. He did not have to rec give this blanket recusal. He was forced into that. And it's really hurt the uh, administration. But I think this investigation, you got to look at it threefold. Uh, something very important happened. Mike Flynn, who is an immediate subject, he's being targeted like Paul Manafort on you know a ridiculous uh, issue about whether or not he did the correct filing, which I think typically, Roger, what is that, a $50,000 fine? Well, actually, when you represent a foreign country, you have to file with the U.S. House of Representatives and a FARA registration with state. Uh, Flynn filed with the House of Representatives, but he failed to file at state. Therefore, he clearly wasn't trying to hide anything. It, right. was, it was inadvertent. It was just a legal mistake. But if he were hiding something, he would never have filed with the U.S. House of Representatives. A very, Bogus. A very plugged-in uh, media person who we both know, but I don't want to name, break the confidence, told me that he has a friend. And the friend met with uh, the general after he was unceremoniously fired, only served for 24 days with General Flynn. A couple weeks after, General says, I'm, I can't find work. 
I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. Meets with him when the investigation officially starts. My legal bills are already mounting. I'm going to go bankrupt. And then meets with General Flynn most recently, a couple weeks ago, maybe a week ago. General Flynn says, everything is great. It's everything is working out now. Uh, somebody is taking care of my legal bills. When it was announced that Donald Trump was going to pay four or four hundred thousand to the staff to try to cover some of their legal bills, um, there was a very interesting thing that not a lot of people noticed. Flynn came out and publicly said, "I will not take any money, any any money, any legal fees from Donald Trump, the President of the United States, or the RNC." So what does that tell me? Tells me that Flynn, I believe, is cooperating with Mueller to talk about what went on during a, a very important point, not the campaign, the transition. Because the Fresh Prince of the West Wing, Jared Kushner, has a big problem. He has 666 Fifth Avenue, where, which he bought for $1.8 billion. It's known as the worst real estate deal. The white elephant. Yes. And he has to come up with something like $700 million. Jared, apparently... Was, has, was planning or was meeting with sovereign wealth funds of countries during the transition. He even met in the Waldorf. He was dumb enough to meet in the Waldorf, which is owned by the Chinese, with a uh, Chinese you know, state-run uh, investment fund to talk about getting funding. That deal was about to close until it was broken, until it was reported in the New York Times. I'm told by others that there were other, there were other meetings. And Jared, as we know, met with the Russian banker, when he, the day he met with the Russian baker, who had been under sanctions since 2013, Jared says, we talked about the sanctions. The banker says, no, we talked about business. We talked about private business. That's where I think Flynn is, and that's where I think Mueller is concentrating. And I also believe, by the way, that's one of the things that Comey was looking at, and that's why Jared worked for two weeks to convince the president to fire Comey. You know, besides the fact that he's a political ignoramus, he's a, he's apparently a real estate ignoramus, and he's not even good at being corrupt. The guy's a liberal Democrat. You think they're usually good at that, aren't they? You would, you would think so. <laughs> now, I understand that Mueller is now very focused on the Donald Trump Jr. question. Right. And specifically... Uh, how the Trump administration handled uh, mm -hmm. a, an inquiry from the New York Times right. regarding whether Donald Trump Jr., who I think is a good man, he's and, a very good man, and a patriot, uh, and a true believer in he's our one reform of us. agenda, he is one of us, and he's an info warrior. We know that. <laughs> right. Uh, I believe that Donald Trump uh, Jr.'s situation um, has become the focus, uh, uh, and as I recall, the Times made an inquiry. Correct. Uh, the White House uh, announced uh, that the meeting uh, had only uh, addressed the question of adoption, mm -hmm. uh, which is a flashpoint between the Russians and our country, uh, and that subsequently documents leaked out of the White House Correct. that showed that that was untrue. Now Mueller wants to know who wrote the misleading statement, Correct. who was involved in that, was it the president, was it Hope Hicks, the very capable uh, mm -hmm. communications director, a fine woman, I think someone very loyal to the president. Right, and talented, uh, by the way. Uh, and, uh, uh, and what is the point here? Because I don't see an obstruction charge over the writing of a press release. Right. What is it that Mueller is trying to prove? Well, if Mueller can prove, that, so let's remember, you had a New York Times article you had an inquiry, they had an inquiry from reporters. One of them was Maggie Haberman. The inquiry was about a meeting, that they heard that there was a meeting between Russian lawyers and Don Jr., Jared, and, and Paul Manafort. They wanted to issue a statement. They had to issue a response. And this was done during the G20. It was later reported through the Washington Post. I don't know if this is accurate, that the president was even discussing this on the margins of the G20. The Washington Post reports that the first statement they gave out, the statement by Don Jr. said the meeting was only about adoption. That's all it was about. And that's uh, talking about Putin's law where he's banning uh, uh, Russians from being adopted by Americans. Okay. Five days later... So that article comes out on a Sunday, five days later, on a Thursday, four days later, emails are released to the New York Times. The source of them being white, a White House advisor is listed in the email. It's an article by Maggie Haberman. The emails say that uh, a, colleague, a professional business colleague of the Trump Organization, Donald Trump, as we know, had Miss Universe in Moscow. Somebody connected to that said, I have Russian, uh, basically I have Russian officials who may have information on Hillary Clinton. We'd like to coordinate a meeting. And Don says, if it's true, that's great. By the way, no crime at all. 
No, no crime at all. Nothing improper in that. Um, in fact, if you were running a campaign for president, would you want that? And somebody you knew came to you and said, "I have uh, evidence of malfeasance by your opponent," and you didn't ask a follow-up question, you'd be guilty of of uh, of, of, of mispractice. Unless to say you're the least. Clinton campaign paying for the dossier, right? Yes, that's exactly. that's okay. And uh, pardon me, overpaying for the <laughs> dossier, nine million dollars for that piece of crap. Amazing. Right. <laughs> so. So then the issue is these emails are released. Many people think, many people close to the situation believe that Jared released the emails because Janie Gorillac had already had the emails, his Democrat lawyer that he hired. And he released the emails to make sure everything was out in the open. And the emails showed that the statement, frankly, was not an, a, you know, a very accurate statement. It, didn't, it, was, it was pretty tight. It was overly broad. And Washington Post, therefore, reports that the president... I don't know if this is accurate. The president on Air Force One drafted the statement, and that's what Don decided to do. Why does Mueller care about this? Mueller cares about this because he wants to show it as evidence, as a trend, that the president will issue misleading statements to go back to obstruction for his reason, reason for firing Comey. In other words, with the multiple reasons that the administration gave, it was very sloppily done when they fired Comey. All they had to do was say, you're fired. They didn't yeah. have to give any rationale yes. well, at all. Well, the mistake was not firing Comey seven seconds after the president <laughs> took his hand off the Bible. Uh, I think that's a terrific analysis of the situation. Sam, do you believe mm -hmm. that Mr. Mueller will bring charges against Paul Manafort? No, I don't think so. Do you think Mr. Mueller will bring charges against the president? No, I think he's going to issue some kind of report like the Star Report. Uh, are we looking at a 25th Amendment scenario in which the political establishment tries to remove Donald Trump on the basis that he is uh, uh, mentally unstable? Uh, perhaps Kelly uh, Mc, uh, McMaster and Mattis would try to attempt to do something like that. I mean, I think that is the next uh, play. I reported on this for InfoWars earlier today. My sources tell me that that is where they are going. They grow impatient with Mueller. They doubt whether uh, Mueller can successfully bring an obstruction charge vis-a-vis -vis the Comey matter uh, and the 25th I Amendment. Do think, I do think Kushner is going to get indicted. Uh, the other point I guess I would make is uh, under the 25th Amendment, if the vice president and a majority of the cabinet believe the president was incapable of discharging his duties, the, uh, the president could uh, appeal that to the House of Representatives controlled by Paul Ryan. Right. <laughs> uh, the fix would be in. Mike Pence would become president. Paul Ryan would become vice president. God help us all. <laughs> Thank you for joining us here. Sam Nunberg on The 